Welcome back to Inspiring Entrepreneurs Montreal, showcasing stories from outstanding business people. My name is Dan Delmar, along with Mike Newton of Video Canada. Hey, Mike. Hey, Dan. How are you? Excellent. How are you? Very good, thank you. Today on the program, we're, uh, I mean, it's really tough to top last week's guest. We had a, a man who was the chair of the board at Invested in Montreal and runs a tech startup and an incubator all at the same time, France saint elémy What an inspiring guest on, on the show last week. Yeah, it was fascinating. He said we didn't even know where to begin with him last week, so it was uh, was great. To, uh, it, it, it was a lot of fun, and uh, but I will tell you, I think uh, this week we got a lot of energy, we got a lot of enthusiasm and passion coming our way. Yes, a lot of passion from uh, Etienne. He is the head of Vention, and it's a software engineering company. Basically, they they put together factories, and when you go to their website, I was really astounded by the. Uh, uh, the user friendliness of it. It's like you're shopping on Amazon or Ikea, except you're just picking factory parts and adding them to your cart. And some are, you know, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars in cost. But the simplicity of the online uh, Ikea experience is there. It uh, definitely is an expensive Lego block set. There's no doubt. I mean, it's uh, it was a lot of fun to uh, to see how they're doing things, and and I, you know, interestingly enough, I think it makes it, it brings it down to uh, kind of the layman's uh, level in terms of understanding and and that whole perspective of you know having something pre-made and and, and having it you know that level uh, in very short order being working is is actually very fascinating and I, and I think our guests are really going to enjoy listening to uh, listening to how we uh, how we got him to uh, to to dumb it down for uh, for at least for you and I yeah it's in Lacroix on the way CEO of Vention and very impressive company some of the investors Fidelity Bain Capital White Star Capital Real Ventures and more and uh, big clients too including uh, Tesla and Apple and Facebook and BMW Really impressive company. Yeah, definitely a company that again is is showing the strengths of Montreal's uh, marketplace, and uh, again showing the appeal of foreign investment into uh, into Montreal's companies. And again, it's uh, it's it's what keeps our economy going, and and it certainly is is great to, to see these things feed up, feed upon themselves in in, in a sector that uh, you know continues to play so well in the tech in the tech world. And we'll talk to Ernie Furt, tax partner at BDO Canada. Tax tips with Ernie, of course. It's that time of the year. And we'll have some basics on uh, preparing uh, personal and organizational taxes on the way later in the program. First, though, Mike, speaking of technology, BDO is calling for all tech entrepreneurs out there as applications are open for BDO's VC Pitch Day. And so that gives selected emerging and scaling tech companies the exclusive opportunity to pitch their business to the incredible venture capital investors at BDO in May 2023. So for info on that, go to go.bdo.ca slash vcday for details. go.bdo.ca slash vcday for more on that. Mike, what are you looking for as uh, you'll presumably be judging some of these uh, young companies? I mean, it's, you know, somewhere between obviously the, the, the ingenuity and the invention side of things, but also as, as you start looking at these things as the practicality, right? I mean, it, you, there's some great ideas out there that don't always have the practical element to it. And, and a very large part of a lot of these deals is the people that are, that are working with it as well. I mean, I've seen guys that have made, you know, uh, great inventions over the years that just couldn't get them off the ground because they couldn't put a good team together. And I've seen other, other things that we've, uh, we've, we've seen go, yeah, you know, I'm not so sure about that, but man, they had the right people in the right environment. So I think, you know, really looking for a good mix between the technological side of it, but also the players. Uh, and let's face it, if we're going to continue to play on an international level, the technology is important, but so is that team behind it. A lot of people in tech or interested in tech will be uh, super interested in what Etienne has to say about uh, succeeding in that very competitive industry that's on the way. Uh, let's get to some current events, though. And first, Mike, uh, some, uh, some more developments on the banking crisis in the States that has specifically been affecting uh, the, the tech industry. And a couple more banks having issues this week. Uh, UBS has bought Crazy Swiss. Uh, SVP depositors have been made whole by the U.S. Fed. Uh, HSBC is buying SVB's UK assets, so a lot of assets moving around um, and a lot of exposure to, um, in, in particular, some tech assets. 
Yeah, I think a lot of people are having a little bit of PTSD going back to 2008, uh, you know, as we watched the banking sector around the world, but particularly in the U.S., crumble under uh, under the, uh, the subprime uh, investments. And I think the one important thing that we all need to recognize right now is the balance sheets of the banks today are very different than they were 15 years ago when we had the last collapse. Um, you're sitting with balance sheets now that actually have solid assets on them. Uh, if you go back to the subprime, I mean, there was a lot of garbage on the balance sheet and the garbage was covering up more garbage that was somewhere else. So there was, there was a real weakness last time. Uh, this time there's still a little strength. And, and as we're seeing by either the governments uh, working out deals with some of the other banks to come in, step in and the banks themselves stepping in, there's a lot of money on the sidelines still. So there's a lot of there's a lot of safety and security within uh, within the banking sector. Uh, I think this is going to be very bank specific. Uh, you know, I fascinated the other day to, to actually read that there are over 4,000 different banks in the U.S. Not branches, but actually different banks. And there are very tiered uh, policy and procedures in, in place at the smaller banks versus the bigger banks. And you know, we look at Canada 2008, I think, proved that we are one of the banking powerhouses in the world, despite some of our complaints with our banking system. Uh, you know, the, the, the way we keep reserves, the, the, the way we handle deposits and investments are very, you know, very solid. I think the bigger banks in the U.S. have learned that from the last time. But I think a lot of the smaller ones are either uh, sitting in the tech industry and are overexposed or have done a really poor job of matching assets. I mean, I'm still trying to figure out how banks at that level, you know, can have such a massive run on cash uh, and not have any cash on hand when it's all been invested in a long-term basis. So there's just this incongruence between the actual investment itself uh, and the access to cash that they have. And, and part of what you're going to see is we're going to continue to see assets being sold at re reduction uh, in the market as they try to realize cash. And if you look at your, you mentioned it before, the SVB branch of, of uh, the UK branch that was bought up by HSBC. I mean, HSBC's paid one pound, one pound for the entire SVB UK banking uh, platform. Um, and basically just had to make the depositors whole at the end of the day. I think I see a big capital gain coming somewhere down the road for, uh, for HSBC. Um, the one that hit, and it's probably about the time that, you know, we were on air last week, uh, becoming a little more obvious, is the Republic Bank. Um, and that, that whole sector... Uh, I, I first Republic banks right out of California. I mean, there was two issues with that one. One is uh, insiders dumped about 12 million of stock before the 70% on the collapse. So, you know, now those things are kind of hard to bypass. It means that there's there's something going on that, that people are seeing, and I think that reduces uh, a lot of uh, credibility within the sector. Um, but on the upside, you know, uh, I think it was six banks at five billion a pop. Uh, put money into to create liquidity for uh, for First Republic Bank. So again, there, there's a lot of support that is not necessarily coming from the government coffers, which was public money as we saw in 2008, but is really finding its way from other banks that are they're seeing an opportunity to uh, to take advantage of situations. Having said all of that always somebody going to be left holding the bag at the end. What kind of role do you do you think social media played? Because we know the panic uh, was fueled to some degree by social media and uh, blew up perhaps uh, quickly. I mean, uh, you were mentioning, I think it was $43 billion traded in one day. So social media, social panic having uh, something to do with that, certainly. Yeah, SVB Bank, they said in the first 24 hours after the, I guess, the, the fear mongering uh, uh, took place, $43 billion was moved around at SVB. And they said the majority of that, I don't know the exact percentage, but, you know, 65, 70% of that was in the first hour or two. And all of that was fueled by the tech industry itself and its own ability to, uh, I guess, feed, feed the frenzy from a social media side or within. So, you know, that influence on on this, I mean, we, we, we go back to, you know, we've all... We've all at some point seen, you know, it's a wonderful life and the run on the bank and, uh, you know, showing up with your wheelbarrow to get your cash in South American countries so you can take it home because of inflation. And, you know, we're not talking about a world like that anymore. We're talking about an environment where, you know, in, in, in the span of 24 hours, $43 billion can leave and move, or, move around the system. I mean, that's, 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 that's GDP of many countries. 
Speaking of social media, social panic, I would, I would go back to the, the panic over Eli Lilly and company. Uh, this happened in November. So uh, a silly rumor started on Twitter. They were going to give away insulin for free, which sounds like a great idea personally, but it was not true. And their stock, I'm just looking now, has actually not recovered since then. It's still about you know $40 off the stock price it was in November following that social media panic. Dan, it raises the question, obviously, on, on, you know, what is social media and social media platforms responsibility to curb rumors and, and, and how do we deal with these things? I mean, we had this conversation a few weeks ago when we were addressing the whole discussion of uh, China, the, you know, the, the, that whole TikTok scenario and where is, if and where is there a responsibility here? So, you know, when you look at an Eli Lilly and you, you look at this discussion that, I don't know where it started, but I sure, certainly from a, from an Eli Lilly perspective, we know where it's ending right now, and that's not in a great place in the market space. And we've had a lot of these. You know, where where are we going to take our responsibility on social media going forward? And and is this become freedom of speech to the nth degree? And there is no, I don't want to say censorship because that's way too harsh, but some kind of moral obligation to make sure some of what's going out there is is real. I'll just end on this because I'm, I'm big on free speech. I, I've, I've always studied liberal philosophy on this question. And the, the big phrase that's popular to mitigate these debates is often my right to swing my fist ends where your nose begins. However, when you apply that logic on online social media, super powered by algorithms that are designed to promote misinformation, according to studies, six times faster than the truth, where does free speech uh, land there on the internet? So it's not really free speech if it's weighed against the truth. I agree. I mean, and, and I think that, you know, as we've been told on many occasions uh, in the capitalist world, we need to find a new definition for profitability. Uh, I think we need to new, find a new definition for what really is fair in terms of, in terms of free speech in, in these environments. Inspiring Entrepreneurs Montreal and those in tech in particular are going to be very inspired by Etienne Lacroix of Vention. Uh, certainly not at all uh, a fly-by-night uh, crypto uh, kind of situation. No, he is building robots and, and helping people build factories and uh, getting you that equipment, sometimes overnight. Etienne Lacroix, CEO of Vention. Etienne, welcome to Inspiring Entrepreneurs. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for having me today. So the first question is the easiest. What is Vention? To some extent, Vention can be qualified as industrial Lego. Our mission is to democratize industrial automation. And we do that with a self-serve platform where practitioner of the field, manufacturing professional, can go online, you know, design robot cells and automated equipment by themselves using virtual Lego parts, automate those machines, order them, uh, and deploy them all that with software assistance. To some extent, we're putting the tools in the end of uh, you know, millions of practitioners that can now automate their uh, factory by themselves as a result of the uh, simple user experience that we're bringing to them. To give you a sense, Vention right now is around um, uh, 3,000 uh, client, around 350 employees uh, with offices in Montreal, Berlin, and uh, Boston. I read the website. I listen to you talk. It's just surrounded by Lego. Uh, you know, there, there's there, there's a little bit of engineer geeking, I guess, going on in uh, in this side of things. Uh, you know, the, the the website talks about how you were dismantling VCRs and building full size airplanes and suspension bikes. And in the meantime, my father was yelling at me for putting a puck through the garage window again. So, uh, you know, how can you dumb this down for the rest of us in terms of uh, what what drives you there and 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 what this looks like? So let's start with how how come I got there. Um always been passionate about building new things, you know, product development. In fact, when I was a, a very young kid, I told my dad I wanted to become an, an inventor. He told me that was not a job and I had to become an engineer, uh, which, uh, which I did um, you know, a little bit later in my career. And being passionate about product development, you're passionate about the software that enables you to create those products. So we call them CAD software. And around 2014, it was actually possible to create 3D, um, you know, engineering 3D in the browser, you know, create stuff in 3D in the browser. And as soon as this was true, the workflow of Vention, the mission of Vention became possible. This kind of single places where engineers can go online in their browser and design real machine, like with those virtual Lego parts online and, and eventually uh, order them. 
this was basically replacing a workflow I had done myself as a very young and eager engineer between 19 to 24 years old, probably hundreds of times, designing back deck machine in the, what I call the traditional way for company like uh, Messier Dauti and Montsupé and others. And suddenly that, that very kind of a cumbersome user experience became very, very simple and very fast. We can imagine that all those steps could take place in the browser. That idea came in, the, you know, in my mind in 2014. Um, and at the time, I was on the, on the dark side of management consulting. And to rewire your brain to go from a, a well-paid income to no income at all takes a little bit of, a, takes a bit of time. It took me a year and a half until I decided to leave my, uh, you know, my day job and um, start the business. And that was in the summer of, uh, of 2016. So two things. Um, first is I can hear your father now as any father would going, you want to be an inventor. You're not going to make any money, son, get a real job. Uh, the second is, you know, you talk about leaving your day job to move forward uh, on something, but it took you a year and a half what took you so long? I mean, this, this is like, this, this is an entrepreneurial discussion, right? At the end of the day, was it fear? Was it dollars? Was it confidence uh, or a bit of everything? It's all of the above. Um, first of all, to have no income when you're the provider of the family. I think I had a three month old daughter at the time. You feel a little bit irresponsible to take such of a risk. Um, at the same time, my career was going very well. I had very good client as a consultant and you wonder if I go do that startup and it doesn't work, will my career be off track now? And I've built so hard to get it to where it is today. So all those things play out. Ultimately, for me, it came down to, uh, to three mental tests. And I'm going to name them, which are a little bit intense. So I'm, I'm giving you a notice here. But the, the first one, probably the most intense was, if I was to die today, would I be proud of myself? And uh, the answer became more and more no. I was very happy with the, the track I had so far, but the fact that I never tried to go play for myself instead of playing for others was start to uh, you know, putting some weight on my shoulder. My second test was, you know, if I was to earn the same amount of money, would I be here today? And again, as a management consultant, you're well paid. There's nothing to complain there, but life is just a little bit more than that. It cannot be money alone that stick you in a, in a certain track. And, and if it is, it's just a constant reminder that you're not fulfilling life's passion. Um, so that was my second test. And my third one is, are you in the right dog race? Because being a management consultant is a race uh, with the end spot becoming a partners. And um, you, you give everything you have to it. Um, uh, but if I have to give everything I have to a cause, was that the right one? And I felt for me that was just not the right endpoint. I never thought or desired to become a, a partner in, in such a firm. Um, and those tests became true over and over again every time I was asking it to myself. And eventually I got the click that it was time for me to absorb all those risks. It's very interesting because it, clearly there's an entrepreneurial spirit that existed even while you were working for somebody else. And just the, just the, 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 the strength to ask yourself those questions and make, make the move in and of itself is, I think, is what decides the difference between running and owning a business and being an, empl an employee. And, and, you know, we've had those many conversations over the years on this show, as well as, you know, in our own firm. Some people are employees and some people are entrepreneurs and you, you, you can't necessarily squeeze a square peg in, into a round hole. Uh, the other thing that, that entrepreneurs deal with is failure. Uh, you know, you're making errors, you're doing, what are some of the things along the way that you did wrong that you would do again? And what are the things that you did wrong that you go, no, you know what, I would do that wrong again, because I learned so much from it. I think one thing you learn is, is uh, we go quite fast adventure, but if I had to do it again, I think I would be able to go even faster with the confidence that I'm that I'm not pushing people too hard, right? Because as, as most people, you do a lot of introspection. You want to make sure you're, you're inspiring, but you don't want to burn out people either, right? So you're always navigating those two lines. And my own level of intensity might be very different than the level of intensity than some of the employees that we have today. Um, but redoing it again, I would probably be able to go even faster 
and uh, while protecting the happiness of everybody, right? Because you learn a lot about the fastest path from A to B as you're building those um, those businesses. The rest of the lessons I've learned are, are so tactical. You know, we should have hired five account executives sooner, you know, six months. And at the time, they would have like doubled the valuation. You know, th those little tactical thing in the big journey doesn't change much. But in a very short journey, it does change quite a bit, uh, but very, very tactical. To go fast is what you know is what you learn. You know, doing it again, you know, the the amount of fear that I would have or the amount of perceived risk that I would have to do it again would be a fraction of probably what I had to endure for the first time you're doing it. I appreciate you being forthright about your intensity and when you're at that level, you know, pressures of investors and all that that's that's inescapable. What do you do to unwind? How do you do to manage that intensity in your downtime? Not a lot. I think as a as an entrepreneur, um, that build uh, an I, I grow business, your entire life, and what I mean by that is your entire life is minute, has to be geared towards that mission. And my life is entirely structured around making invention successful from my downtime, my uptime, the time I have with family, everything is optimized around that single mission. But um, uh, one thing I do to stay sane is I run a lot, so I run. And running is interesting because I still work. I can write my investor letter when I run, you know, in my head and memorize it. I can think about my next management meeting and what type of tone and positioning I will take. You know, I can do a lot of thinking when I'm running. Um, but at the same time, it removes a lot of stress and um, bring clarity to your thought. So I run. I run a lot. I spent a lot of time running for myself over the years, too, so I just can't seem to get away. Um, you know, I, what, I, what I find fascinating on the intensity discussion is managing intensity with a team around you. Not like, and you mentioned earlier, not everybody has the same feelings. I think you need a core group of people who have similar intensity and similar interest in order to tolerate uh, the intensity. It's, it's not always easy living with an intense individual. No, it's not. And you, you surround yourself with also people that are, are dampered to your intensity, right? You just, um, and it create balance in the organization. Like the, the CEO and the exec are incentivized in such a way. And I think it would be unrespectful to believe that everybody should behave um, accordingly, uh, considering the level of incentivization change uh, as you go through various roles in the business. Um, but you... Um, you know, as the one that leads the march forward, I think you need to to role model as much as you can and being respectful that some will take different choices for various very good reason. But you need to be the one that marched the drumbeat. And from a leadership perspective, when you're the one um, in the weeds, working with the team and that ask yourself probably more than you would ask everybody, more people are just willing to follow than if it was just me telling and not doing. It's Yen. Um, we were talking about uh, about the product a little bit. I'd like to dig in a bit more to the system because I see on your website here and from a, a content marketing perspective, I have to say it's, it's pretty fascinating because you can basically add stuff to your cart that are parts of your factory. I mean, uh, and some are quite valuable, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 here. I can see uh, very complex equipment, but the website seems pretty easy. I mean, almost like Amazon is, is t tell us about the uh, the concept there. I think the analogy of Amazon, Ikea is often used, right? So, um, you know, the, the, the journey that our uh, typical users will take is to basically uh, go in their browser and start a new design in a 3D space that run within their browser. And in this environment, they can, um, you know, uh, Lego design their own machine, whether it's a robot sells to palletize or to do pick and place or to assemble a, a given finished good. And as they, uh, you know, connect the Lego parts to one another, they see the price of their machine being added up. Uh, so they have price transparency. But because they design in this environment, we can help them with a lot of guidance. We can recommend the next best part. We can make sure that their design respects some laws of physics. Uh, we can make sure that uh, none of the component will be missing at the end. And, and then as you would do on a lot of website, you can, um, uh, uh, first of all, automate it in a low code, no code environment. So we even somebody who've never programmed a robot will be successful in this environment to get the robot to move from A to B and perhaps to come back at a different speed and program all those motion and, and then simply order as you would to your point, Dan, on, on Amazon, for instance, and we'll uh, pick, pack, ship your very own machine uh, in an IKEA format. You'll get it you know, roughly the next day or a couple of days later ready for you to assemble, but we'll guide you through those steps as well. Equip with your browsers, we'll 
guide you with the software assistance to the act of assembling, wiring, turning on your machine, putting the software on it, and deploying it successfully to your shop floor. Right? You know, we are still at the beginning of that of that industry and that motion of giving the tool directly to the practitioner uh, of the factory floor. Um, there's a long way ahead, but the uh, amount of use case we can support today is already quite quite valuable for our client. There's significantly more work ahead, but there's a good amount of work that was done already. Interesting. So I guess unlike my IKEA builds, there's not supposed to be parts left over at the end. Um, you know, <laughs> the, the, the tough the the, the the part I'm having a hard time putting my head around, and maybe that's the numbers guy in me and not the engineer in me, is the simplicity with which you talk about the assembly. I mean, how much customer support is needed? How much am I if I if I decide I'm going to I'm going to build a widget? I mean, wh- how are you walking me through this? Is this on site? Is it on the phone? Is it both? Yeah, this is a great question. And and this is not a zero one answer. This is a spectrum answer. Uh, you might be decided to do something very simplistic, perhaps just a pedestal with a robot on it. And if you need support, you're gonna call the customer success team and we're gonna answer you within usually within five minutes and we'll assist you right there. But this is a pretty simplistic case. Is, you know, some other clients are designing full assembly line with several robot arms that all works in coordination to one another. And, and obviously the project like this will be a little bit longer, probably four weeks, right? From the ideation to the delivery and commissioning. And we have various services to support our client up to the deployment here. Yes, we have software assistance, but for a more massive project like this, uh, we can go up to sending some of our technician on the ground as well. So, you know, at the end of the day, if we want to have a client who comes back and is engaged with us, we need to make sure that his deployment is successful. So, and for us, that doesn't stop with the website transaction. It stops when the machine is running on the factory floor. Interesting. Are you, are these technicians on staff Are these people that you have, or are you outsourcing? No, no, we have a team. We call them the delivery team and uh, they uh, travel all around the United States and Canada to go uh, help our clients that are doing more complex or very complex type of deployment. But I would say the vast majority of our client, that's around 97% of them are actually self-serve. And that's the um, just the beauty of the simplicity, right? That the invention can provide. And in a context where there's labor shortages impacting most manufacturers, uh, we end up in a world where folks that used to operate the floor which are how to find can now be the floor, the folks that design the floor and automate the floor, which you need a bit less of. So it's a, it's a win-win for a lot of people, right? Like the fact that democratization and simplification of those industrial technology, it's happening now. Invention is a good example of that is probably the best cure we have against uh, labor shortages that we face right now in manufacturing. So if I order today and you're going to send it to me tomorrow, I have to assume we're not starting from raw materials necessarily when we're putting this through. What's the what's the assembly process or the manufacturing process b- before it goes out to it? Is there lead time? Are you guys, you know, assembling parts yourself? Kind of give us a little bit of that, uh, I guess, the shop mentality here. Yeah, so around 50% of our customers get their order shipped the next day, right? And based where they are, they're going to get it usually the next day or within two, three days at that point of all in North America and Europe. Um, but we don't manufacture a part custom to our client. That's why we have those Lego parts, right? Industrial Lego parts, robot arm, conveyors, structure, sensor, motors, and they're all ready to pick, pack, ship, you know, in your very unique IKEA box, right? So that's why when you order today, if you order by 4.30, uh, luckily for you, you'll go probably on the evening shift where we're going to pick back that order and it's going to ship probably the following morning or something like that. Uh, the process of deploying, interestingly, is actually probably easier than IKEA. And hopefully you will not be ended up with loose parts because we do give you, just like IKEA, a step-by-step you know, printed instruction. Uh, there's only one screw type across all of Vention hardware. We were pretty picky around how we've designed that hardware. So there's a single tool needed. Um, uh, But but joke aside, you will end up with probably around four or 5% of excess screws because we do put that excess in it. So we don't want to hand you up with IKEA to your point where you do have some extra part, but you're missing a screw. And that's the one thing that we do a little bit extra here. 
So this is not a shoestring budget. This is not an organization that you start with, you know, five grand and, and you're rolling cash flow on a $10,000 $10, a week budget. I mean, obviously there's some significant investment here. Uh, you've had a number of partners along the way. Do, do you feel comfortable talking about uh, not necessarily individual partners, but maybe the strategy that you, you have behind using them and why you chose some of the partners? Yeah, It has to start with the market you're in, right? And industrial automation is a massive massive opportunity, right? It's a market of $180 billion at the TAM level and around $64 billion at the SAM level. And when you're in such market and you have such of a clear value proposition, you cannot take that space using your own money. It's just, you're never going to get there. And you have to use outside capital. In our case, it was from venture, uh, venture partner. So we were very lucky over the years because we assembled our or pool of investors, uh, making sure that each of them plays a distinct role. So very early in the adventure, we had White Star Capital from here in Montreal that join us. Right after, we had Bain Capital from Boston, uh, a city I have tie with, and we went to pick expertise in this case that had deep expertise in robotic as a fund. More after that, we went to pick shop, um, uh, Georgian Partners in Toronto, right? the fund that uh, helped create Shopify, the best venture fund that we have here in Canada. Very excited to have them. And more recently, Fidelity joined us as well. And Fidelity is a massive investment house. And, and there's an intent here as well is to make sure we continue to professionalize uh, our investor base um, because we're in a market that will command that type of investors. And what is a better way to learn than now uh, to we're getting ready for those moments? So as, as we wind down quickly here, where are you going with this? What are your goals? What are your objectives? I know it's not a one minute question, but you're going to have to answer it in one minute. So Yeah. No, and I think what's interesting is, again, is, is the market and the fact that right now we're significantly ahead of the trend on democratization. You know, through my career, I've always been an industrialist, right? I'm a very passionate about industrial business. And now we have a chance to build a massive industrial business right here in Canada. And I'm quite passionate about that. Um, we have the opportunity eventually to be an IPO uh, ready company, a public company. Uh, we have also the opportunity to stay private if we wanted to. Um, we'll have to navigate those questions in the coming in the coming years, but the market ahead of us is so large, right? The two biggest players in that industry is Siemens and Rockwell and do respectively 15 billion and 7 billion of revenue not a valuation of revenue, right? And and we have already a significantly head start in that new trend, that new divide of the market between the simplify uh, market and the traditional market. So we have a very rosy future ahead of us here. And we'll get to Etienne Lacroix's one piece of advice for inspiring entrepreneurs. The CEO of Vention shares his thoughts in a few minutes. But first, let's turn to our expert, Ernie Furt, as a tax partner and occasional guest host here on the show with uh, BDO Canada. Ernie, welcome back. Thank you. Always a pleasure to be here. And Micah, apparently it's tax season, uh, I'm told. Yeah, apparently that's the rumor going around town. I hear that. Some people have told me that. Yeah. So it's that time of year again where, you know, Ernie gets to uh, pontificate on the words of wisdom of tax time. Unfortunately, Ernie, I don't think there's a lot of really exciting new stuff this year in uh, on, on the personal tax component of things. So um, are we going to be able to have you entertain us long enough here? Well, we'll see, because there, there's always things to do, because people have to gather up all their materials. You know, by now, people have received most of their tax stuff, not necessarily all of their tax stuff. Because there's certain deadlines that, that have to be adhered to. February 28th is a deadline where most of the tax slips are available. Uh, that is like a T4, a T5, your RSP slips, uh, which can be March 1st as well. Uh, but there's another deadline, which is March 31st. March 31st is for trust uh, returns and trust information returns and partnership returns. So therefore, if you have an interest in a partnership, you're going to get a partnership slip potentially in March or just early April, or you're going to get a T3 slip for a trust unit that you own also in uh, end of March, early April. So you may, you may or may not have all your tax stuff, but there's certain tax stuff that you get during the year. And, you know, in the old days, everybody used to take that tax stuff, put it in a box called tax stuff. And they, and at the end of the year, they would give it to their accountant, give it to their brother-in-law, whoever prepared their tax return. And they were good to go. Now, all these receipts come in different ways. They either come in by the mail or they come in virtually. 
And you have to set up files in different ways, virtually, uh, with your donations, with your medical receipts. You know, you should go to the doc, uh, the, the doctor. You should go to the pharmacy, and and get a copy of your prescription slips for the year. If you were not part of a group insurance plan, if you're part of a group insurance plan, then you have to download the documents from the group insurance plan that tell you your medical summary for the year. And certain group insurance plans will cover everything. Other others won't cover dental. Others won't cover glasses. So don't forget, you know, your glasses receipts. Don't don't forget stuff like that. And always tell your accountant if there's any changes in your circumstances. Did you have a new child? Did you buy a new house? Did you sell an old house? What did you do? So there's a lot of things to do. And especially when you're putting your stuff together to bring to your accountant. Now most accountants don't necessarily want that paper bag or plastic bag, but you can't even get a plastic bag. So you have to go buy one for 75 cents at the store. And then you have a, your little virtual shopping bag and you could bring it to your account or alternatively, you're going to send stuff online to him. So it's, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, as much as uh, there's a little bit of gagging there in the 75 cent bag, I mean, they're, they're, this is a topic. I mean, we're living in a world where, you know, the costs continue to rise on everything and, you know, anything and everything around us. Um, what are some tricks that some of the some taxpayers that are bringing their goods uh, into whether it's BDO, whether it is, you know, somebody else on a smaller side, how can people at least help maintain some of the costs? Because traditionally, the uh, let's drop it in a bag or a box uh, required a lot of uh, a lot of sorting. Well, so people can clients can do their sorting by themselves. So if you're going to scan slips to your accountant, scan like slips together. So if you have a bunch of T5s, scan them together. If you have a bunch of T3s, scan them together your donation slips, your medical slips, all together. Don't put them all over the place and then label documents PDF 7, PDF 3, PDF 4. Save those documents on your desktop. Rename them properly as to what it is. Uh, you know, T5 RBC, uh, T5 CIBC, T4. You only work for one place, so T4 is fine. If you work for four places, then T4, uh, you know, company A, company B, company C, you know, Organize it that way. Make sure you speak to your, if you have a investment broker, make sure you speak to that investment broker. Obtain the uh, investment summary for the year. Obtain what is called the tax package from brokers. So they will give that to you. Accountants can't get that real quickly because what's going to happen is, is, is you're going to have to access things on a secure basis. You're going to have to go into their website. You're going to have to check things. Then you're going to have to start downloading everything as opposed to the client downloading everything and then taking it and shipping it off to the client. Uh, you know, one thing that we're always missing, capital gains and loss statements, we're always missing costs. So look for those things. L try to, you know, all those emails that you got from your accountant last year asking you for different stuff, take a look at them if you still got them and try to give your accountant all of that stuff. Just make it easier on that accountant's life because uh, it's uh, quite a taxing season. But um, uh, <laughs> the uh, and many I, happy returns. Exactly, Ernie Furt, tax partner at BDO Canada. Thanks so much, Ernie. Thank you. Until next time. And as we come to the end of our broadcast, let's turn to our entrepreneur and ask him for his one piece of advice for inspiring entrepreneurs. It's in Lacroix. What do you think? The, the topic I'm going to use today is one I I often teach at uh, Santec, one of the incubator we have in the city, and. As an entrepreneur, um, there's so many sources of capital available to you. Some will be patient, some will be less patient. But make sure that you're very deliberate about pairing the business model and your business ambition with the source of capital that you take. Right? If you decide to do venture, is because you expect to be able to triple the valuation every two, three years. And if you don't want to put yourself into such pressure, into such intensity, don't do it. There's beautiful businesses that would never have been built with venture capital. SNC-Lavalin cannot be built with venture capital. Linamar you know, or Magna cannot be built with venture capital, yet they're masterpiece of the Canadian industrial fabric. So just be very, but they're built over a much longer period. They're built over a hundred years. They're not built over 10 years. So just be deliberate about an entrepreneur. What do you want to do yourself, right? Do you want to go through such pain? Do you want to have a more lifestyle business? What type of control do you want to keep? And make sure you just um, have a very definite answer to those questions. And, and once you have, get the right source of capital that will fit those preferences. 
And Mike, to conclude, it's into someone who uh, owns his intensity uh, and uh, and is clearly driving the business because of it. Most definitely. And uh, I love to see it. I'm, I'm a rather intense individual myself, so uh, I can empathize, sympathize and everything else eyes that comes with that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I do think it is. Uh, is part and parcel of, uh, of an entrepreneur. And, and, and I think that, uh, you know, it's once again, great to see uh, the Montreal based uh, energy and, uh, and uh, intellect uh, continuing to, to shine on the world stage. So congratulations. It's here. Thank you. Intense, but uh, kind as much as I can. Yeah. I'm not I sure can. my wife would agree with me on that one. She'll say I'm intense, <laughs> but the kind one's a whole different conversation. Now, I have to try to not put a robotic arm into my shopping cart here, so I'm going to leave it there. Etienne, thank you very much. Fascinating conversation. Amazing. And I think one of my salespeople will likely call you if you leave it in your cart for two <laughs> Please. <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe to Inspiring Entrepreneurs as a podcast uh, on iHeartRadio, iTunes, or your favorite platform. And log on to the website, inspiringentrepreneursmtl.com, for hundreds of local entrepreneur profiles. See you back here next week. Good talk.